Today is Wednesday, April the 4th, 2012. I'm Matthew T.G. I'm Heath Mulliken. I'm Steve Stanley. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to The Technology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. The world's only user antagonistic podcast. This is episode 151. 151? And uh, 51 yep. a significant number, but not as significant as the number 55 today. Happy birthday. Happy to birthday. Steve Stanley. Yes, I, uh, I feel honored to be on this show, this special commemorative show, I'm sure. Yes. It was set up to have a distinguished guest yes. in honor of my birthday. So. Yes, and we do want to welcome to the show today. That's a, that was a great segue, by the Good way. Good job. <laughs> we want to welcome Dr. Wayne Schmidt to the show. Wayne's a 1979 graduate of Indiana Wesleyan University. He holds a master's degree from Calvin Theological Seminary and a doctorate of ministry degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. After college, Wayne joined Dick Wynn in founding Kentwood Community Church in the greater Grand Rapids area. He served that church for over 30 years, leading it to become increasingly multi-ethnic as it grew to over 2,600 in weekend attendance and eventually planted 10 churches, which in turn gave birth to four granddaughter churches. In 2010, Wayne became... Excuse me, began his role as vice president and chief operating officer for Wesley Seminary at Indiana Wesleyan University, giving strategic and operational leadership to the seminary. Wayne has been married for over 32 years and, uh, excuse me, to his wife Jan, who's professor at Taylor University. Together they have been blessed with three children and two grandchildren. Wayne, welcome to the show. Great to be here, and I'll join Steve at 55 later this summer, so. Oh, okay. Wow. So I want you guys to know that you are only seven years younger than my mother-in-law, so whatever that means. <laughs> you're, oh, Jackie's, you're almost. Jackie's very young. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so Heath, uh, the tournament, you actually did pretty good on your bracket. Now, I you did, didn't get the, the I champ. Did, I but. got the whole Final Four right. I got the, the two teams in the championship game, but I did pick Kansas over Kentucky and missed that. But I dominated so uh, so greatly through the rest of the tournament. They actually won two brackets, uh, and including the technology bracket. So I, I gave myself a, a prize. And uh, so, I, I, so they'll, that'll Awful be gracious of that'll, yourself. that'll be coming out of the account. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> speaking, it will not be coming out of the speaking account. Speaking of prizes, uh, as you guys know, Dr. Schmidt is the author of Ministry Velocity, and we're going to be giving away a copy of that today. Uh, we're actually going to be giving the copy away next week. So, anytime between now and the show next week, if you go and uh, post on our Facebook wall, The Techology Show, or mention us on Twitter. Pretty much do anything to get our name out there. That's we'll right. Enter We're you desperate. To enter, <laughs> enter as often as you like, and uh, you can win a copy of this. Well, as really often great... as you like, but we'll only count two, right? <laughs> That's we'll right. Count enter one, as often as you... one Facebook and one Twitter <laughs> entry. But, but uh, is there that you go. entry up on our 900 number? <laughs> 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 but uh, a great, great book, and and like it's been. You know, said, we should we should give people a third a third opportunity. <laughs> yes, voicemail. Let's do that. Call the voicemail. So you got and three leave chances your, yes. to enter: one on Facebook, one on Twitter, and one by leaving that's better us odds a voicemail. Than the Mega Millions. No. <laughs> <all I'm> no. <laughs> one if by land, two if. Oh no, that's <laughs> <laughs> leave it to the history guy. All right. Well, Wayne, it is great having you. We appreciate you being a guest on the show today. Um, we do want to discuss your book, Ministry Velocity. Um, before we do that, there may be some listeners who are not familiar with your story. Why don't you tell them a little about your ministry journey? Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a 1979 grad of Marion College, now Indiana Wesleyan University. Uh, when I was there, Laurel Buckingham, gave a challenge to a group of us to pray that God would call us to a community where we could spend a lifetime. And there were two really unique things about that. One was the idea of being called to a community. The other was spending a lifetime somewhere. And I prayed that prayer with all my heart, with my good prayer partner, Dennis Jackson, my buddy. Uh, yeah. And uh, God called me to a church, to an area where there was not a Wesleyan church, Kentwood, and a partnership with Dick Wynn, uh, who was a lifelong mentor to me until he passed a year ago. And I did. I served that one uh, church all of those years. Uh, as you said earlier, real value placed upon being a multiplying church, mm -hmm. and then in the later years being a multi-ethnic church, which uh, both of those resulted in a lot of 
personal growth for me, and uh, it was also a blessing, I think, to the community and the church. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, in the introduction of Ministry Philosophy, uh, you make it really clear that one of your concerns is for sustainable momentum, and you use yeah. Joshua as an example throughout the book. Um, two questions. Why did you pick Joshua for that, and uh, how did you personally draw from the life and leadership of Joshua in your own ministry? Well, um, that whole issue of sustainability, I think, is huge, uh, not only for churches, but as I've been in this role, realizing sustainability for pastors and ministry leaders is a great issue as well. Um, I chose uh, the Joshua in the book because I, I really wanted to talk about some of the lessons I'd learned in ministry over the years. But I wanted them to be integrated with the Word and, and uh, founded on the Word. And Joshua has such a powerful journey. Uh, we first are exposed to him when he's a very young leader under Moses. And we get to see his whole lifetime. So yeah. I think that was a key part of it uh, for me. And then personally, I, I related to that whole idea of taking new territory for God as a church planter and felt like I had a Moses mentor in my life with mm. Dick Wynn. So I think those were a couple connecting points as well. You know, in the pre-show, Wayne, um, I, I told you that as I was going through this book, there were uh, a couple of things that stood out to me. And in the back of my mind, I kept going back to a seminar uh, that I was in that Steve Moore led. And kind of two tracks here. One is momentum for the church and the ministry of the church, but then more of a concern for me, and I think for our show, because we're trying to resource ministers and people in ministry, is this idea of sustainability in our personal ministries. Um, you know, Steve Moore said something that just rocked me. Um, he said, in terms of the leaders in Scripture, a, th a third of them, we don't know how they finished. But he said, uh, another third did not finish well. Only one third re record that they finished well in ministry. And um, I, mean, I see this as, as, as part of the concern um, here um, in, in your writing and in ministry in general. Yeah, and recent stats, unfortunately, I don't think we're doing as well today even as they were doing in biblical times. Uh, when you take the failure to launch issue, people who studied for ministry but never entered, and then you take the casualty list that occurs in the first decade, and then the tendency for people to... Um, maybe be in ministry physically, but having emotionally and spiritually even exited that ministry. And then, of course, the whole issue of midlife crisis and not finishing well and so on. So uh, I, I've developed an even greater passion to discover why certain ministry leaders for a whole lifetime have vitality and energy and to see what can be uh, understood and maybe the rest of us can benefit from. Sure. I think uh, pastors that are listening today would agree with what I'm going to say next, that as pastors, one of the greatest challenges we face is uh, the issue of negotiating change, mm -hmm. seasons of change, change points in the church, and you address uh, change in your book. And I wonder if you'd comment on a couple of things that I want to lift from the book. First of all, you say that God doesn't allow us to, quote, live in the past, close quote, and you talk about the change continuum. Would you uh, care to comment on either one of those? Yeah, I. this has been an area of study for me. My doctoral work actually related to change and how change happens within the life of the church. And a lot of things happen to pastors and ministry leaders in the process of change because it's, it's so uh, daunting. Um, and we know that local churches, in most cases, reach their peak of missional effectiveness before year 20. I'm convinced that part of that is they have a history and a past, and they start to uh, become mm -hmm. bound to that past. Uh, you know, I'll date myself a little bit, but the old paradigm theory says... Uh, those who have the greatest investment in the previous paradigm are the last to see the new paradigm. Mm. And uh, that's why I'm concerned that if we're captivated by the past, we're going to miss the new thing God's doing. Um, so in the book, I do talk about the change continuum and where people fall on that continuum, whether they're early adopters, middle adopters, or late adopters. That's common in the literature. 
What I've discovered in local churches, however, is the longer a church has been stuck, the more the distribution tends to be towards the late and the never adopters in their parishes. Mm -hmm. And then when they go to uh, engage the congregation in change, it's even more difficult than you would expect based on the normal adoption curve. Mm -hmm. I wonder, Wayne, um, we, I mean, there's so much in this book. I mean, we talked in the pre-show. It's just really hard to unpack the whole book. So, you know, we've lifted things out that personally talk to us. You know, for me, Chapter 8, you talk about the measurements of success and a movement of God. I want you to briefly talk about that. I think one of the, the great challenges that we have in ministry is, number one, defining success. I mean, what, yeah. what do we mean by that? Um, and let me just speak to our own context. So all of us here are West, Wesleyan ministers, and one of the things that I struggled with now that I'm in district leadership is that we talk about issues of spiritual formation, um, issues of kingdom principles, and yet we have this annual service report, and it seems like it boils down to a couple things. How many seats are, you know, uh, were, how many people were in the pews, and did we yeah. pay our budget? Now, that's yeah. a gross oversimplification. I mean, I think here you kind of give us a tool. So talk about some of the measurements of success. Yeah, I, you know, I wrestle even with that word success because it's been so yeah. impacted by our culture. You know, I think the biblical concept of fruitfulness, that God not only expects faithfulness, but fruitfulness, has been much richer for me. And I do think it's a responsibility to wrestle with what is fruitfulness and are we experiencing it uh, in our ministries. Um, You know, when I served in a local church setting, which that's really, in my opinion, still where the action is, Um, we worked really hard to say, what does fruitfulness look like? And those measurements you referenced were part of the the grid for us, if you will. But if I think if you just focus on those two things, there's a real danger of having a very um, limited view of what is fruitfulness. So in the chapter, I... uh, allude to things that are found in Joshua, like uh, in when the transitions come, and they do in every local church and every ministry leader's life, were we obedient in those times of transition? Uh, did we seek to involve God pe- God's people, or was it really all about us? In other words, how much did we equip mm-hmm. the believers for the work of ministry? Yeah. And uh, what is the credibility or the reputation of the leaders? And one of the areas I'm just passionate about these days is how do we steward the credibility in God and trust to us? Um, and then after we're gone, uh, what's what's the legacy of those who knew Christ and knew us? And what's the legacy of those who don't yet know God but were impacted by us? And then, uh, you know, finally, the, uh, the sixth of the six I mentioned in that chapter, is just how much are we still um, enamored with and dependent upon the power of God to intervene and to work in a situation. How much do we, uh, one of the things I love about being Wesleyan is we really do believe that there is a power that makes a difference. And uh, so are we still believing that at the end of our ministry? You know, Wayne, I, this whole thing of equipping, I think that, uh, is, is huge. And I I know in my own context, um, you have some family members who, uh, what I call casual users of the computer, and they'll ask me, well, uh, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And so I, I set them down behind the computer, and after a while, it is so painful that I just want to get them out of the seat and say, here, let me, I, let me let's do this, you know? I mean, let me. And I think that for pastors, a lot of times that we fall into this trap that, well, I'll just do this. Yeah. Um, and yet, in the end, it's to our detriment. I mean, if you had... Yeah, a room full of pastors where this was kind of the syndrome where we're, you know, we're taking on too much. Um, it, it can become overwhelming. I mean, where do you start with this whole thing of equipping um, the laity or equipping staff and, and beginning to let go a little bit? Well, I think you start with just biblical teaching about the body of Christ, spiritual giftedness, and hitting head on the myth that pastors have all the gifts and they can do all that's necessary. I, you know, one of the <laughs> one of the things that 
became of that kind of teaching in our congregation is they realized where I was not gifted. And if that was <laughs> going to be done well, uh, we really did need them. You know, the boy needs help type of thing. Uh, I think there's also, uh, and I want to be really careful because pastors already feel a load a bit in this area, but I, I think there's a danger that the emotional rewards of being like the go-to person, Ooh. being the center of it all, uh, they tempt us. Um, mm. You know, at the end of my ministry, having been the only pastor that was there for the whole stretch and only one that most people knew in that church setting, you know, one of the things our board and I worked on is how do we be, how are we completely fulfilling our mission and vision without being dependent on any one person? And that really focused us on, you know, building teams and equipping others uh, as as believers. So I, to me, it's uh, back to just the whole biblical concept of body and to the extent sure. we own that and we're to live within being part of the body and not trying to be the whole body. That really frees the laity for their ministry as well. To kind of follow up on, on that, one of the questions in the chat room is is really twofold is what are indicators that that a pastor can look for in their own life that it's it's time to move on mm. from a position but then what are also some indicators like you guys were trying to be intentional about the the lay people you know adopting the mission and vision and living that out so what can a pastor look for to to get get some assurance that you know if I leave everything's not going to fall apart yeah yeah well um I do think there is a tendency anytime you encounter resistance, which is one of the four stages of the change process, it, to feel like, wow, maybe God's calling me somewhere else, you know. So I think uh, <laughs> approaching those times uh, with reflection, with prayer, and with trusted counselors, what the Quakers used to call a clearness committee, uh, is really uh, critical. Um, and in my own case, um, you know, the transition ended up surprising me. There were times I begged to be released, mm, and I uh, wasn't. Yeah. And then when I thought, boy, there had never been greater days in, in terms of my own personal fulfillment and ministry, and then God says, you're done. So it is more of an art of dependence and intimacy with God wow. than it is, you know, a, a set of dashboard indicators that say this is it. Um, I do think that... Um, one of the ways we measured laity being involved in ministry was how many understood their gifts. In other words, had been had had some biblical teaching and interaction and a spiritual gifts kind of uh, test. And then a second is were they actually engaged in ministry that fit the way they were wired? And then how many of them had really hmm. uh, arose to the point where they were leading and influencing others in the process? And that. Uh, helped us to say, okay, what are they learning, what are they doing, and how are those with leadership gifts exercising those gifts in the body? Mm. You know, Wayne, one of the things that has been an aha uh, experience for me on the district, we have really learned that with this thing of ministry, getting to what you just said, the idea of people have gifts, they have their own personality, and what we've realized is churches have personalities, too. <laughs> And um, that from the district leadership, I mean, there is this responsibility to try to get to know a, a minister and then to know a church um, because you can have, you know, the, the, the right person in terms of someone who is genuinely called, but put them into an, uh, a situation and a context that can be disastrous because the two personalities don't match. Yeah. You are so right, and I'm so grateful. You know, there used to be a philosophy out there, and this was terrible for pastoral persistence, is, you know, you had the difficult church to fulfill, fill, so you, you stuck the new guy in it, you know, yep. and the kind of philosophy was, well, if he survives that or she survives <laughs> that, they'll get a, get a better church, you know. Uh, I, I remember one pastor years ago saying, I've had two possibilities and a potential. Now I'd like a church, you know. <laughs> that feeling of, uh, so I do think there are churches that have reached a point of dysfunction that even the most seasoned veteran is going to find it one uh, you know just terribly daunting to uh, 
to try to provide a positive leadership in that context. But if you take those uh, churches kind of out of the mix, I really do believe that match that you're talking about, and I love uh, Tim Rail's statement. He calls it harvest help. Uh, yeah. You know, who is best to help harvest the what's happening in the community for those yet to be reached and to bring the the highest level of help to the church? What kind of gifts and personality will That's do good. that best in that context? Yeah. yeah. I was... Uh really impressed with your choice of words here moments ago when you were talking about your relationship with the Lord and, and how he would speak to you maybe at the, the pinnacle of success. And, and you, would, uh, you would characterize that as, a, as an art. And that took me back to early Methodism uh, and the, the plan of um, they, would, they would inquire about whether people had holy arts. What holy arts are you developing? And as you talk about many things in this book, there's just no way you can unpack all of this for us, but what are the things similar to that perhaps that you'd like to mention that we haven't asked you about today? Yeah. Well, the, one of the things I love about Joshua is it starts in chapter 1 with this intimate encounter. You know, it's, it's only him and God, and uh, the creator of the universe is dialed in to him, and... I just don't believe there is any replacement for intimacy, the mm -hmm. connection to the vine. And one of the great concerns I have as I interact with a lot of pastors is we've substituted comparing and copying yep. for calling. And calling only really arises out of uh, that intimacy with the Father and hearing his whisper you know, my sheep know my voice. Uh, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who responds to my voice. So that's a real passion point. And I love it in Joshua because that's where the book begins. I, I call it a gut check, just him and God. You know, are we going to do this and are we going to go as far as we can go? And another thing that I really hope comes through in the book is um, be strong and courageous. You know, oh. that phrase that's repeated. Oh, and man. it takes courage to plan a church. It takes courage to help revitalize a church. It takes courage to keep a church focused on the mission more broadly. I don't know of a setting in which forward movement of God's work doesn't require be strong and courageous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the questions uh, in the chat room, uh, you, you've mentioned a lot about uh, spiritual gifts. You, you've talked a lot about lay involvement. Uh, at Kentwood, what were some of the tools that you used to help people uh, discover uh, spiritual gifts? I know uh, we've, you know, used different ones, and some are really good, and some are not so good. What What were some of the tools that you guys used? Yeah, and you're right. There's so much more available today than I remember back in 19, uh, 1980 setting in a conference with Jim Garlow called LITE, L-I-T-E, Lay Institute to Equip. And Jim was teaching this conference, and back then there was just nothing hardly except the old modified house questionnaire for uh, mm -hmm. spiritual gifts. Now there are a lot of possibilities uh, that are found on the web. And uh, in our own case, our denomination, uh, Tim Rail and others provide those uh, things. I, I was just in a seminar with him recently, and again, he provided a, a spiritual gifts questionnaire that is really helpful. I like the, the spiritual gifts area as a beginning point, but I also like the uh, complementing of that with books like um, the one, Living Your Strengths. I don't know if you're familiar with that, no, but it's no. based on the same research is the secular book, Now Discover Your Strengths. Uh, but it's designed for people in ministry. And uh, it has the uh, online questionnaire that identifies your top five strengths. But I love this book because it also then matches them with potential ministry opportunities. We really use that widely and found that was a very nice, a uh, tangible complement to the emphasis of spiritual gifts. Mm. Yeah, uh, I just looked it up real quick. It is on Amazon, and you can get that in uh, Kindle edition as well. So. Yeah, I, I recently got the book, um, I guess it's Marcus Buckingham, Stand Out, 
and it kind of has a gifts assessment. Yeah. And I was amazed at how we were in the process of merging two churches, and uh, my, that was my gifts was collaborating people and being a catalyst. And I was like, oh, this thing's pretty good. We nice. might have to get some more people. <laughs> uh, uh, You're a brave man to merge two churches. Good for you. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, uh, well, hey, I'm trying to be strong and courageous. Right, real quick in the chat room, uh, Priscilla Hammond says that 12 Stone and Skyline both use Discover Your Strengths and Living Your Strengths. So mm, awesome. Yeah. That should help some And they both listeners. use the same questionnaire online. But again, I love the Living the Strengths because of its immediate application to ministry context. Yeah. And yeah. it's cheaper, I think. <laughs> one, one of the things that we, we failed to mention is, and, and one of the reasons uh, we're having you on today is that Outreach Magazine just uh, announced Ministry Velocity, uh, Velocity as their leadership resource of the year. How, how, what's the what's that email look like to say, hey, we we love your book, believe in your book, and and of all the leadership books produced this year, you're number one. What was that like? Um. It was humbling. Um, I really appreciated Bill Eason's comment most of all that it wasn't just a, a how-to guide, but it really prompted people to think about how God was at work around them and through them. Uh, so that, um, in a way, that was the highest compliment that what we were trying to do in the book, not just have some, quote, uh, expert, uh, unquote, which yeah. is a myth in and of itself, prescribe, here are the one, two, three steps, but to really engage with the word and then say, how does uh, God, uh, how is God showing me what that means for me in my ministry context? Um, in, in the book, one of the things you talk about is how long and deliberate the process uh, was for you and Kentwood to hammer out your vision and ministry for the church. Uh, at one point, you say that the vision statement was generated over a period of years. Uh, why do you think that process was as lengthy as it was? And uh, what advice would you give for a pastor, especially one that perhaps just merged two churches? Uh, what <laughs> kind of advice would you give as they lead their congregations through that process? Yeah. And, you know, I've taken some uh, pushback on this one and should. I am a planner. I am a... Uh, you know, faithful in little things, opportunity with much. So part of it is my wiring and someone who's much more intuitive and spontaneous and so on, I'm sure it'd be different. Um, but another part is I think sometimes people view strategic planning is like, I want to get a finished product. Hmm. And for us, it was always a work in progress. And that took a lot of heat off us, for one thing. We didn't have to have it perfect because it was subject to adaptation as things changed. But also, wrestling with that document, revisiting it on a regular basis, um, provided a context for ongoing discussion and ongoing decision-making. So probably the best way to, de to describe it is that um, it wasn't so much that the formal strategic planning process was going on all the time, but that we always viewed it as a work in progress and always wanted to keep interacting with it versus putting it on the wall saying, check that off our to-do list yeah. and moving on. Yeah, you know, now, Wayne, it's interesting. I found that part of the book very refreshing because— mm -hmm. If you, as you've already said, that part of that's probably due to your personality. Yeah. But our experience is this, as ministers, we go to these conventions, and usually the one who's speaking is not that deliberate. They are charismatic. It, they, they can get the vision and mission, you know, in dream overnight, and then they implement it, which is wonderful as it suits their personality, but this is the first time in reading a resource where I saw this process so deliberate. I, I, I thought it was refreshing because, um, you know, there are just different personalities in ministry. And that whole principle of um, if you can be trusted with little, you can be trusted with more, or the parable of the talents, that phrase, faithful with few. Or I love Zechariah 4, not only because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, but a little later he says, don't despise the day of small things, 
And I think one of the myths out there is if there's going to be momentum, I've got to do 20 things or I've got to do something really big. And in my experience, based on kind of how I'm wired, it's little things done faithfully and intentionally over time that start to get the flywheel turning and it begins to take on a life of its own. But it often begins with just a couple of little things. Yeah. Uh, Let me say this, too. I I thought your chapter on change was particularly strong. Um, and I think that you do a masterful job, of especially speaking to those who aren't really, they don't have a predilection towards change. Mm-hmm. And you do a great job here of saying our past should inform us, but we shouldn't be camped out there. And, and I think that for many of us in ministry, that is really where the rub is. How, how do you honor the past but not live in the past? Yeah. And, you know, I, uh, the truth is that as you look at how Wesleyan pastors are wired, uh, Paul Hans and others have done study in this area, there is a real uh, a tendency towards um, consistency uh, and so on. And not, there's not a predominance of apostolic entrepreneurs among us, you know. So <laughs> I do believe that... Uh, we need to uh, learn how to honor the past because that's at the very heart of many of our pastoral leaders and yet recognize what ultimately honors the past is to embrace the future. You know, one of the great things about Wesley is how the movement grew after he was gone, uh, not just grew during his lifetime. And that increases the honor of the past when the future is vibrant and healthy. Yeah, very good. Well, listen, Wayne, we appreciate you taking time out to be with us. Uh, before we let you go, uh, why don't you give a shout-out to Wesley Seminary um, and uh, tell our listeners what's going on there. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> if you want job security. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're really blessed. Uh, we're uh, about two and a half years in. We have about... Uh, 250 ministry leaders who are engaged with us as students. Uh, Almost all of them are active in their ministry context. You know, our philosophy is we come to you. We don't ask you to move and be in residence with us. And that's really allowed us to serve a breadth of pastors. It was fun. Our recent Spanish language cohort, our youngest pastor was 29. Our oldest was 65. So, you know, it's all life seasons. And uh, so we exist to serve people who are engaged in their ministry context. If people do want to find out more, we're just simply wesley.indwes.edu, or they can uh, uh, email at wesley at indwes.edu, and we'd love to share more about that. All right, and where can our listeners find you on the Internet? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, there, obviously, I'm easy to found. Uh, they also are welcome to uh, join me by Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, um, uh, or email me. Uh, that's just Wayne Schmidt at indws.edu. All right. And if they're Wesleyan and going to General Conference, they probably could talk to you live, couldn't they? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I will be there. Looking forward to it. So glad you guys are going to be there. That's awesome. Yeah, on that note, uh, we haven't said much about this, but uh, I think it it would be appropriate to say a first thanks. Wow, we've uh, we've got people sponsoring some of the days that we're there, and Wesley Seminary is doing that, and we are... Very grateful yes, and honored, too, so. to, to receive that from you all. So thank you. Well, I hope you sense we really believe in what you're doing and are thankful for it. So it's a great voice in the life of the church. Thank you. All right. Well, blessings on you, Wayne. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye now. Hey, thank Bye-bye. you. Yeah. Um, once again, we are giving away the book, A Ministry of Velocity. Heath, how can our listeners get a copy of this? Again, just uh, in the, over the next seven days, mention us on Twitter. That's at Techology, or go to the Techology Show on Facebook and post something on our wall. Or uh, you can call us at thirty forty nine Teology and leave us a voicemail. And somebody already has. Yep. Yeah. Somebody we already we've received our first voicemail entry for so, this. Um, Isn't that exciting? So that's uh, three ways that you can enter 
And uh, I, I tell you, you know, from talking to Dr. Smith today, I, I believe he's going to be successful in ministry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I tell you, you just have this ability to see the future. There. I, you know, I he, he spoke at the gathering last year, and his story of the transition yeah. that they went through. It's powerful. It, it just really resonates with me. And um, just, I mean, he is a hero. I mean, not just in our... Uh, denomination, but just the way he he has led, he led a church, and now, uh, how scary is that? It's like, hey, we're starting the first Wesleyan Seminary, and, and to to have it be successful. It's great to hear him in the book explain how grieved he was when he sensed that the Lord was actually calling him to leave Kentwood, and at that time he didn't know that he was going to Wesley Seminary. I would really encourage uh, the reading of this book if you're in ministry. Uh, there are sometimes you read books yeah. uh, and you're discouraged when you're done. Right. Um, not so with this one. Yeah. It has good practical stuff. I would say at any level in ministry, it's going to speak yeah. to you. Yeah. And this is where I think his personality is a strength to this book because yeah. he is not um, what you you know this this flamboyant, charismatic. I mean, this is the the slow and steady. And in some ways, his life really has modeled. Um, the life and ministry of Joshua. This, you know. Yeah. Here's the thing. I mean, the the we do a lot of we do a lot of interviews. We've been very blessed. But the answer today that really stuck out at me was, you know, when I asked him about what are the indicators, how do you know? And he he said, you know, there's not a chart that you can go by. It's about intimacy. Yep with God. And I think that answer shows you this man's heart and that shows you why God has blessed his his ministry. And, and what question. I would say to, to, to young pastors or pastors in general, I think we do try to, we try to see churches that are successful and we try to find the chart and we try to find the next gimmick or gadget and we just need to get back to that intimacy with God. Yeah, and, it's very central to his book yep, and yep. to his life. All right, let's move on to Download of the Week. Hey, our Download of the Week this week is one that we have done before. We're bringing it back again, though, and that is Caliber. Some call it Calibre. But yeah, it's... Some, erroneously. Raise your hand, well, Matthew. <laughs> well. uh, Caliber is this great program that you can put all your ebooks into, and what's really great about this program is that you can then take those ebooks, put them on your Kindle device, it will convert it over. And Steve Stanley here put me on to the fact that a lot of these old uh, books uh, that Wesleyans, founding Wesleyans produced, they're on Google Books, they're in EPUB format. So I've been able to take those, uh, bring them over into Caliber, and then put them on the uh, Kindle, and now you can search these things and you just found you, you gave me one here you put me on the one that was great and it had uh, just comments about luther lee one of the founders of our denomination a lot of great books out there. Yeah. yeah this is a free program it runs on mac it runs on pc it also runs on a linux and platform. it's got it's got more tools in it than you oh. i mean then you hardly have time to learn it's incredible so there's another cool thing that i absolutely love that it did you can set it up to scrape rss feeds and send you yeah. basically a daily newspaper that then is indexable through your Kindle, so you actually dig into it depending on the types of stories and stuff. And it is it is so cool. Like so, you can follow exactly what you want and have those emailed right to you. Really, really neat. Really, really cool tool. I mean, I don't. I think that one area that it does struggle, if I were to talk about a con in it, is that there is a lot that you can do with it, and the interface isn't just like an extremely easy to figure out right, right off the bat. It's a right. little bit difficult, yeah. but uh, it is it is worth taking a look at. And I actually, I went to look and see. I'm, I, I remember maybe asking that we do this for a download of the week, but I don't think we actually okay. have. So I think this is a first time for Calibre, which is spelled Calibre. It's C A L. I B R E, I think is how it and is. And here's what I would recommend. Go to there and before you download it, watch the instructional video. It's about an eight minute to ten minute video. If you watch that, you'll understand basically how the program works. And can we encourage you to do this? If if you find the program powerful and you start using it, please donate. I mean, someone has given their time to this, um, and it's, again, a free free product. But if you're using it, um, do the developer a favor and uh, donate. Yeah, they, and I'll tell you now, a developer appreciates 
even if it's just a, a little bit, like mm-hmm. we use every week for our show uh, a tool called Cam Twist. That's how we get the video feed actually recorded and sent out to those who watch it live. And uh, I mean, I wasn't able to do much, but just the other week I sent him 10 bucks and said, you know, let me buy you lunch. Thank you for, we, you don't know the kind of use that we get out of this tool. And he actually responded and was like, hey, thanks. You know, I just, I, I appreciate that. Sure. I and mean, that's, that's just huge. Yeah, very good. All right, let's move on to They Said It. Read my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. I took the initiative in creating the Internet. The Macintosh, of all the machines I've ever seen, is the only one that meets that standard. Well, I'm not a crook. If you, if you know what you're doing here, slide, slide out. We're constantly evaluating our services. Since launching Google for Nonprofits as a consolidated offering last year, we've received feedback from many organizations and believe this change will allow us to help more organizations take advantage of Google services. Google spokesman Parag Chosky explaining a change in Google's nonprofit services, whose guidelines has in, had initially excluded numerous groups, including schools, political think tanks, churches, proselytizing groups, and any group that considered religion or sexual orientation in hiring decisions. Source, Christianity Today. On the origin of species uh, with, oh God, Richard Dawkins, when asked for the full title of Charles Darwin's famous book entitled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, Dawkins was promoting a poll that found two-thirds of British Christians cannot name the first book of the New Testament. Source, BBC Radio 4. People think the market should offer cheap products. In the past, they came at the cost of cheap labor in China and workers' rest time and welfare. But now, we all agree that things have to improve, and as an ethical manufacturer, we must improve the welfare of employees. Jay Hong, chief financial officer of Taiwan's WinTech, a maker of touch panels for Apple and other brands with annual revenues last year of $3 billion. Source? Reuters. So, um, okay, I want to run to Steve's Yes, here. yeah. Because it is so great. I think yeah. we need a little bit more setup in context. Like the, so, so Dawkins said to the crowd, or said to somebody... You know how many Christians can quote the the books of the Bible? Is that what it's it was? It's the first book of the Old yeah, Testament. How many, how oh. many, yeah. Well, he, there was a poll that two thirds right. of British Christians couldn't name Genesis, the book of Genesis. And so somebody responded to him and said, "Can you tell me the the full title of the Origin of the Species?" Which is an incredibly long. It, yeah. Is it, if you're an atheist, are you allowed to take the Lord's name in vain? I mean, I, I see about this. <laughs> no, but I mean, it adds. It sure does add a bit of irony. <laughs> yeah, to I mean that. This, and this, and Steve humor. does a great. You did a great job yeah, reading that. That was wonderful. That well, was great. if you've watched him talk, there's a there's a great video of him online uh, being interviewed, mm-hmm. and it lasts about five minutes. And when when the question is asked about the possibilities of the beginning of life and how he can be so sure. Uh, and and to give one example of macro evolution as from one species into a totally different other species, he just goes blank. <laughs> and the next thing he says, can we can we shut the cameras off after he sat there for about thirty forty five seconds? So it's for those that want to pretend that this. Uh, destroys the argument of the atheists. Uh, it doesn't. No. No. But, no, but but it what it funny. does do, <laughs> what it does do, is show that they don't have rational answers, and they don't they don't have the the uh, ability to stand up on their side in the same areas that they're pointing to the church right. and to Christians yeah. and saying you're falling down on your side. Right. Yeah. They they don't meet the same standard that they're trying to get us to, to meet up to. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. I mean, I read this story with Google and the services that they offer. I'm trying to, I can't quite distinguish what's the difference between the services they're offering to nonprofits and then Google Apps, 
which is kind of business oriented. Um, yeah, I'm and- not sure because for years now we've had the district set up on Google Apps. So maybe I faked it and they think we're a school, but really we're not. Well, I'm just saying it might be something to check into here because this is a paid for service. But if you're charity, it's free. And now churches are before they were they weren't allowed to take advantage of this um, as a nonprofit, but now they can as a nonprofit. And so there just may be features here. Um, uh, enterprise features that you can get free, which normally you'd have to pay for for Google. So. I do know that a while back they really um, they really increased the the amount of stuff in my in my, in my Google okay. app stuff. So I have a lot more features now than I used to have. So it could be that that's yeah. just that there was just a section that I could use it. At I mean, I know for a lot of our listeners, this may not. I mean, you're not quite catching on Google Apps here, but like for our district. Our enterprise program is really Google Apps. That's what we use for enterprise services. Yeah. So when you send an email to, you know, the the district offices at scwesleyan.org, those are actually all handled through Google who, yeah. in the Google servers. Yeah. And uh, Trinity University, International University, just switched over to uh, Google Apps is there. So I mean. Um, big organizations, Christian organizations, are using their services. So we link you to the story. Uh, you can go there, and it may and further link you to what services you know your church might be able to get, or your Christian organization, your nonprofit. Um, we have covered a lot here: Foxconn and Apple, and the responsibility. And um, you should. This article really is worth reading in full because there are a lot of changes that are happening in yeah. China now. And this particular author. Is is saying uh, of the article now, not not the quote here, but the 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 author of the article says that I mean the landscape is really changing yeah. in China. That wages are going up, and we have said before. I mean, a year ago, a year and a half ago, that um, you know our we're, we're not against the 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 workers in China. What we want to do is we want to come alongside them and be their advocates for better work conditions and better wages. That's good for them. It's good. It's good yeah. for uh, business here now, in the United one States. One of the other well. Interesting things that's happened with this story is not just with the with the work conditions and wages, but with time. You know, we we hear about sixty hours a month overtime, and and our minds just are like, oh my word, you got to be kidding me. There's actually kickback, yes, from workers yep. at Foxconn saying because they've they've now changed the rule. Now where sixty used to be the limit, now they're down to like thirty nine. I think I, I don't know, but the, yeah, they've, they've it's, lowered it's something. It. It's something lower, yeah. And so they've <laughs> they, they they've gotten it down lower, and there's kickback saying, hey. We want that time. And what, what's being said is, you know, we're trying to apply a, a Western culture and philosophy of work to what's happening in the East, and that's not necessarily... And we, we made that case. We've talked about this before. That's not necessarily the best way to go about this. These guys, you know, they're leaving home to go work for... It's basically being an, a, an indentured servant is how we would think of it, you know, for a time where they're, they're not going to be there all their life but if they worked for four or five years in this spot, they could really set aside some money. Yep. And they're coming out of some uh, some pretty rough areas of 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 I don't know rural areas, I guess I should say. And so there's a little bit of discouragement in that. So it is interesting to see that that what I'm encouraged about the wages being increased, that's good. Um, working conditions, that's also yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, a lot of humanitarian stuff it going is. on. All right, uh, so we had some voicemails this week. Actually, I had two of them. We did. Now, um, these aren't these aren't entries for the for the book, right. um, but, they, but they're voicemails that we've gotten, and uh, both of them are anonymous. One actually gives their first name, but this first one is anonymous. And uh, so, whoever you are, we absolutely love this, and we're going to find something good to do with it. But are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. I'm ready. You guys rock. There it is, man. Short, sweet, and to the point. And we are very thankful uh, for that. Wow. Wait, wait. Doesn't that sound like uh, someone from headquarters? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to exploit that little sound bite. We're not quite sure how yet. No. <laughs> See, now, don't don't, don't scare people it from leaving voice. It sounds to me like it's a clip from a movie that's been played on. You guys rock. Uh-uh. So uh, I believe it came from Iowa. So... If we have a listener in Iowa, I think I suspect who it might be. Uh, All right, here we go. And then the second voicemail is also quite interesting. Here we go. Hi, this is Carol. You made a donation to the Mannington Fire Department. I was calling to put you on the schedule to have the picture taken. Doing it Sunday, October 30th, and you call. (laughs) It's inappropriate language. (laughs) (laughs) 
So, so we're going to send Steve to have his picture taken on behalf of the show. <laughs> yeah. We're not sure. We don't remember making the donation to the Mannington <laughs> Fire Department, but uh, we, we did, and so we're happy about that. And, uh, yeah, well, so be looking for that, manningtonfiredepartment.com. And here uh, we were Steve's taking picture. our own pictures after the show last week when we took just gone print print <laughs> the We department. can't print those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, we... Too we, much we, chest hair. We, oh. we, we've gotten out of the habit of... like closing the show with a funny story um steve sent me a link to a story some guy has to uh, serve probation or he got fined or something uh what was it he was shooting um he, he thought he was shooting at a bird and it turned out that it was a woman's hat <laughs> oh, it was her mohawk she had oh, dyed her right. mohawk was... red oh and, my word and, so uh, he's thinking he's shooting at a bird no. And she wasn't, she wasn't, uh, I don't think she was injured, was she? Well, Mohawk, she was injured, was. but not, <laughs> not fatally, not fatally or seriously. So she was already under the effects of some substance. And so there's somebody in the chat room. I need to play this voicemail because they just came in the chat room. Yeah. I'm not going to mention names, but I need to play this yeah. one more time just to see if there's okay. any reaction. Here we go. All right. You guys rock. <laughs> All right, there, there we go. Yeah, he's okay. pleading the fifth, but I, you know, uh, you talked about funny stories. I, I just saw this this morning, but the the Masters golf tournament is this weekend yep. in Augusta. This guy and tickets are hard to come by, and this guy's dog ate his Masters ticket. Oh, he made the dog throw up, and he put the ticket back together. And I haven't heard yet if he's been able to use that ticket, but it shows a picture of this. We'll put together a how-to in terms of <laughs> yes. making your dog throw up. What? <laughs> no, we're going to use still, the, boy. We're gonna have to use the cat, the uh, technology show <laughs> mascot. No, we're not doing that to my cat. Uh, As you can I see her there have... over Steve's uh, left shoulder, uh, yeah. she gently rests. I think a minute ago she tried to eat your microphone cord, didn't she? She did. Steve? She did. She yeah. was messing with the... <laughs> the official mascot of the technology show. Hey, listen, let's talk about uh, what's coming up in the future. Next week in studio, Beth Peterson joins us. And then from Scotland via uh, Skype video, we will have Aaron Downs. They will talk to us about Okipe, the orphanage there in um, Haiti. Yeah. Um, and um, Matthew will actually be working on that. In yeah, what, I'll be he- headed out to help in that project yeah, in May. So yeah. looking forward to, to actually getting on site. I've gotten to be in the orphanage as it is right now, and um, I'm super excited that they have this opportunity yeah. to move to a new place because it's desperately needed for those kids. And we'll talk next week. There's a great promotional video. We've showed it once on this show. We'll show it again next week. And this you can download this. Mm-hmm. If you are looking for a worthy project at your church, um, this is why we're having them on. This is a worthy project. I would mm-hmm. love to see you become part of that. On April the 25th, we will discuss this book right here. It's Mark Wilson's book, Filled Up and Poured Out. Um, Many of you know Mark Wilson, Mm -hmm. a great friend to not only Wesleyans, but other people in ministry. Did you see? Did you guys know who wrote the the, the forward? Yeah, I can guess. Mark Batterson. Mark Batterson. Yeah. Batterson wrote the forward. Because he, like, he's... Mark that Wilson actually t- is the one who first didn't like physically introduce me, but via, hey, have you heard about or have you yeah. seen the ministry of? He's the one who actually put Mark, put Mark Batterson screen, on yeah. my radar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good. Um, on May the 2nd, Dr. Bob Bagley will be with us. He's area director of Africa. And if you'll remember, he did this great article about Coney 2012, kind of put things in perspective. Wasn't negative about it, just put no, it in perspective. Right, right. And actually joined us in the chat room that day. And yeah. so we. Where is he in Africa? Don't know. I mean, I don't know where he's, you know. Um, I'm going to be in Nigeria, Lord willing, the first part of May. You'll be teaching at um, Watts, West Africa? West Africa Theological Seminary, which, by the way, they have just worked out a, an articulation agreement. The uh, credits go both ways between Asbury and Watts now. Oh, man, I knew and that they were working on that. Yeah. Cool. So. Yeah, so now uh, I'm just going to say on the air here, you don't have to tell us the gift that you're bringing each of us, so we're, we're, we'll, <laughs> we'll just be surprised when you bring it back. Yeah. I think that there's even a cure they're working on for that gift. <laughs> 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 um, a little technical thing. May the 9th, uh, we're supposed to have Dr. H.C. Wilson on, but... Um, because of a trip to Okipe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Matthew Matthew has done an outstanding job in making a lot of improvements to the show in terms of our stream, um, just the format. But uh, the, the downside to that is, in the past, 
I was able to kind of run things when he was gone. We call it that to the best of my ability, but it is beyond me now. And so we will not have a show May the 9th, and I've got an email in to Dr. H.C. Wilson, and we're trying to reschedule that before general conference. So um, we're working on it, and Lord willing, we'll get that hammered out. Yeah. Well, thanks to everybody for listening. I know you're going to do your closing, but before you do, uh, just as you can donate to developers of certain softwares and applications, we have a little orange donate button that you may see right to the upper left-hand side of the video that you are watching right now. And uh, we uh, will be headed to General Conference. We've yep. gotten some, some day sponsors, but uh, sponsorship of the people, by the people, and for the people is always exciting as well. So, And, and let's go. We already gave props to Wesley Seminary. They're sponsoring a day. Let's also give props to Kingswood University. Yes. They were the first one. We sent out this this plea for um, sponsorship. Within 40 minutes, I already had a commitment from Kingswood University. Southern Wesleyan University, yeah. as soon as Todd Voss got it, within a half hour he responded, president uh, yeah. dr todd voss said uh sounds great can we have two days yeah um so, so that that's exciting and that that's not to that's not to though make it seem smaller the personal donations we actually have had a personal donation too yes. that was almost of equal value yes. to a day sponsorship yep. yeah. of the show i mean it was it was <laughs> so close to that so we really do value uh and we're not uh, now i say all that and it just kind of sounds like wow we're getting rich no. we're not we will Oop. still we will still be spending money out of our own pockets yes. uh, so just whatever you can do that if you'd like to help us out it would be awesome and we would thoroughly appreciate greatly it greatly appreciated all right uh, heath i'm just wondering where could our listeners find you on the intranet if they go on uh heath mulliken.com a rural pastor's uh, journey they can f- go there and find me uh, on twitter facebook got all the links there and uh Man, God is doing some great things in my life, so I'm very excited. Steve, yeah. I'm just wondering where on the internet we could find all your personal information. Probably email. Well, <laughs> <laughs> email me for it. I'll just give it to Thousands you. of things are, are going through my mind that I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> um, uh, Pastor SES at gmail.com, and uh, that also works for Google Plus if you're so inclined. All righty. Brother TG. Uh, sorry, Alex, I'm getting asked a question about advertising packages in the chat room. So. <laughs> we will soon. Uh, MatthewTG.com. All right. You can find me at Facebook.com forward slash AKC64. And let me say this. If you want to do further research on anything we discussed today, yes. you can find and all the links to the stories that we covered at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. And if you want to contact us now, you can send your emails to thetechnologyshow at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail by calling 3049-TEOLOGY. That is 304-986-5649. Leave us a message. And as you heard today, we rock. We rock. (laughs) (laughs) And we will play your comments on the air. One more time, Heath, for those that want to get into the drawing for this book here, Ministry Velocity, what can they do? They can mention us on Twitter, at Techology. They can post on our Facebook page, The Techology Show, or they can call and leave us a voicemail at 3049-T-ology. On behalf of my colleagues, I just want to say thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks,